Okay. So we are moving on to, uh, to chapter 10. And um, I think each time that we had ended up with chapter 9, we kind of, I suppose, gave a little bit of short shrift to uh, um, Moses as a, uh, as a type of Christ. Um, and it's important to realize that typology is, I mean, that, actual, that term actually is introduced by, um, uh, by St. Paul. In the Greek typos, a type of, which becomes something of a, um, I mean, it basically is a um, foundation for Catholic, you know, scriptural exegesis, as it's called. Exegesis is the, you know, the pulling out of the interpreting, the understanding of what it is that God reveals to us. Uh, typology is very, very important. Some, you know, there was a debate in the early church. There were two schools of thought that opened up into uh, a school in Antioch and a school of, in Alexandria. Alexandria pushed perhaps typology beyond where it ought to go. Um, it pushed it to the point that no lo- they no longer grounded their typology in the, um, uh, in the, you know, the literal word or the words of scripture themselves of what was being said, which is, I suppose, a bit of a decadence. But it didn't um, Antioch kind of rose up in response to that. Question. Um, yes. Would, would that mean that they just they saw typology in everything? Yeah, they or they would draw analogies of something that wasn't really related to you know what the what the um, meaning of the um, you know of the scriptural passage was. Um, let's see if I can come up with a good example. Good examples are not things I can come up with very well on the fly, unfortunately. But it would, you know, it could be a passage that, you know, that say, for example, the Moses, you know, about Moses who, you know, was um, walking up, by, who walks up uh, Mount Sinai. Now, a, 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 you know, to receive the law. Now, seeing that as a type of Christ going up the mountain to, you know, for the um, for receiving the um, right or forgiving, if you will, the fullness of the law. The ten, you know, he receives the ten commandments, kind of as a type of Christ, really. And Moses going up the mount, uh, you know, to uh, to give the um, sermon on the mount, um, you know, shows that he is the fulfillment of what that is an authentic type. But um, you know, if you were if the school of Alexandria could be very creative, and they could um, they could push it even much beyond that, and see you know this uh, Moses um, you know going up the mount you know the mountain as perhaps the, even a um, uh, you know a, um, a type of uh, you know the transfiguration, which. You know, when you're talking law and law, that's basically in the text. There really would not be anything in the text, if you will, um, that would you know suggest that you know Jesus's revel- the manifestation of Jesus and who he really is, right? That happens on you know Mount Tabor. Um, in and of itself, that would be something that would be thrown further into it. Now, they could be; they would be even more extravagant than that. That um, you know, um, you know, a um, you know, a ascension into heaven, or some any. I mean, they could right. They could easily Did you say take it was it Alexandria far. that was the ones that were going too far. Yeah, the school at Alexandria. Yes, Father. Wouldn't you say that in the Eastern Church you see a lot more of that than say in the Western Church? Of typology, mm-hmm. yeah, their typology. I mean, in fact, Alexandria and, uh, and Antioch were both Eastern, if you will, schools. So that that school arises really within the East. Uh, interestingly enough, a little bit of an aside. Uh, um, I won't uh, get too far off on the rabbit trails, but the West has theology in the West really takes off with. Um, uh, relatively late with regard to the East. The the West tends to be much more focused on the practical application. How do you apply this in life? You know, how do you apply these in in life? And less with the term, the term is used speculative. We've kind of distorted that term, speculative. 
Speculative, speculation basically comes from the, uh, the Latin speculare, which is to reflect, to reflect upon. We've made speculation nowadays at an equivalent with conjecture, with guessing, and that's not true. It's that call, con, equating speculation with, with conjecture is a distortion of the term, and it really comes about by really a, um, what's called uh, scientism. Scientism is this view that the only authentic truth, the only real truth, are, is empirical truth. And everything else is just guess, opinion. This is how we've come to... But speculative truth all, ultimately is much more certain than empirical truth. Empirical truth comes from in experiencing empiria, Greek instances of things. So, by definition, of very few things can you experience everything of. So you always, the truth that you come to is always provisional, right? Unless we see more that causes us to have to revise our theory. Reflective truth doesn't take, doesn't require, we can see the essences of things. Right? And being able to see the essences of things, you don't have to experience every single one of them to know that this has to be true. That one, an example is the law of non-contradiction that says something can't both be and not be at the same time in the same way. Without that being true, we couldn't speak, we couldn't talk to one another, we couldn't think. And so it can be demonstrated to be necessary. So speculative. So the, the term speculative theology applying to, the, to that of the East, that's where speculative theology basically arises. It's much more practical in the West. It becomes much more speculative you know, much later during the reflective. Am I to understand that the, the early church fathers, they were of the East? Most of them were. Most of them were. Augustine. We had, well, Augustine is one of the first in the West. Okay. Augustine will be one of the first in the West that become, you know, very. Um, a doctor of the church. Yeah, a doctor of the church, one who's. Uh, but he is, he will be. He and Ambrose, um, Hillary, these will be kind of unique until probably the late fifth century or so. And then we see the East start to taper down in their um, in speculative. It, it especially tapers down in the East with the um, invasion of Islam. And they're taken up much more up with and the West becomes much more, um, uh, much more um, uh, fruitful. And, you know, it's taking it aside, taking us off a rabbit trail a little bit. Yeah. Is it, we think of just in general the East being uh, more mystical people, more I don't know if spiritual people and the West being more practical is that. Do you think that's why that happened? That just comes from kind of the origins of those people of being more. Uh, yeah, I think what. Yeah, the East and West in many ways develop in. I mean, the difference in language and the difference in culture <coughs> really rise to a point that the East become is much more integrative, and the West is much more. Um, analytical. The East, in that sense, is much more feminine, and the West is much more masculine. This is one of the reasons, by the way, that St. John Paul II talked about this need for the church to breathe with both lungs again, because we both have the, you know, we, ha we both in our traditions have complementary um, aspects of the faith that need to, um, you know, that need to enrich each other. But culturally, you can, you, I mean, culturally, we can see that. We, we can even see that today. The um, East and the West. The East is actually, in many ways, Japan, for example, eats our lunch in, um, uh, you know, in production, if you will, um, quality, has been for many years, because they've taken, they were able to take the insights of the West that break things down into pieces and parts and use them which couldn't have developed there, but in their integrative view of the world, 
they realize that everything isn't just the sum of parts. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And they've been able to take those insights and make them such that they are attended to things that uh, we aren't in the West. Um, we think we can, we can, we think in engineering we can make simplifications and get away with them. And you might um, in some ways, but in the long, long term, you don't, um, because they, right? Yeah, the whole is much more great, is greater than the simplifications that you make to make predictions. Anyway, the point of all of this being with regard to um, this uh, typology, if we can make our way back to the, the main trail. Typology is valid. And typology will always be valid for this very simple reason, is that, right, remember when we, in our model, that the you know, of understanding God and creation, that it's the eternal logos, the eternal word who creates after himself. And when he creates, everything that exists has to reflect him. Even history, if you will, has to reflect God. God is the first mover. It has to reflect God's perfection. Though in our freedom and in our fallenness, we can take that reflection of God and distort it or take some good out of it and, re and remove it. And so in salvation history, it's no surprise that we had types of forerunners of Christ. Anybody who, right, anybody who submits themselves completely to God, completely to Christ, will put on Christ and reflect him, even if he, you know, even in, even in a natural way, right, even before sanctifying grace. And so it's not surprising that we see things that happen in the Old Testament that, that are brought to their fulfillment in the New Testament, even in the midst of human freedom and fallen caprice and such. So the types that we see of Moses, though, are, are marked because M Moses, remember, is a, um, at a time that we're starting to see the, we, we see the um, firstborn son belonged to the firstborn son was taken away and it was given to the Levites. Interestingly enough, between Aaron and Moses, Moses isn't a firstborn son. Aaron is the old elder. And we, we saw up until that time with Moses, the only firstborn son, the only biological firstborn son that actually got the covenant blessing was Shem, Melchizedek. So, in all of this, what we can say th is that Moses, it takes, Moses has apparently, he doesn't have the, he doesn't take on the role of priest, but he does seem to be prophet king. He certainly is a prophet. He tells in Deuteronomy 18, and remember we talked about the importance of Deuteronomy, is this, Deuteronomy is this, covenant renewal in a sense it's not in the right we had the uh, the overall um, covenant line we didn't point out Deuteronomy and the reason for that is Deuteronomy which is called the second law is not technically between God and the people it's between Moses as God's agent and the people and within that covenant renewal is where we see Moses allows concessions that God himself can't. Right. Those concessions, uh, divorce and remarriage, the ban or the harem. Now, the harem is the ban, is where the separation that God calls for, Moses permits, if you will, interprets. And, and in scripture, it, it's written as though it's coming from God. But it really is this mosaic concession that allows the separation to be, the absolute separation that God calls for in terms of annihilating one's enemies. And that, that is, the harem is introduced in this, um, you know, this mosaic um, exception the band where women and children and animals in fact all are called to be killed. <laughs>
I'm sorry. Can you explain that harem? Because I saw that word in there, and I yeah. Can you just define it? Yeah, harem is in most harem is where okay the separation that we're calling that God call, call, calls as you know and it, well, as a parent right if we look at it in terms of a family God calls um, Israel to separate itself from the nations right it's supposed to be the firstborn of the nations but we see especially the golden calf that what happens when Israel is around the nations we see this in every circumstances instead of leading the nations the younger children as a you know firstborn son in the ways of God they go after the ways of the nations. So the harem is a, is a distortion or a concession on Moses' part about how to bring about the separation from the nations. So harem in, in itself is, it's referred to as the ban in most, in the many, ban? In, the ban, B-A-N, oh. in most, in many English translations. It's the Hebrew is H-E-R-E-M. The harem basically means that when Israel goes in to take a land that they are supposed to possess, they put the people there under the ban or under the harem, meaning that men, women, and children are to be slaughtered. Animals are to be slaughtered. Everything is to be slaughtered. I know, so how did this come about? I guess I don't, I don't understand why. Why it comes about? Yeah. Well, it comes about because it comes, it comes basically through Moses who recognizes that God calls for this absolute separation. And Moses sees when there's anything left, Israel goes out after, goes out to the, um, right, goes after the easy way, the fun way, the less human way. So, and so, so God wouldn't have necessarily wanted them to slaughter everything, but Moses said, hey, we need to, in order, because you're so weak, and we got to yes. clear all that out. Yes, that's exactly right. Now, one of the things we have to say, there is a very strong, there's a very strong tradition in Christianity that it says that God is the author of life, and he can do as he wishes with life. Human beings can't, of course, but God can. And, and the way that Moses presents this, you know, he says the Lord God says to do this. Um, the, there is a, another tradition, it's not as strong, but it's becoming stronger and stronger, especially Pope Benedict especially brings this out in his Regnumsburg speech and his encounter with the um, with Islam which basically actually has borne a lot of fruit even though it started out very um, violently the response to it but anyway the the point is is that he talks about God and he starts in talking about God he starts to address God in a way that takes on what um, t that begins to take on is what's called Islamic voluntarism. That basically means that God can do everything, anything that He wants. That He can contradict Himself if He wishes. And Moses, or I mean, and Benedict starts to show how you know. Let's discuss: Is that really possible? Can God actually command us to do things that are contrary to His nature? Um, the tradition. You know, the Christian tradition from the very beginning is in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is an inter. This starts with Paul, right, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul talks about reading the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he says that the, the Jews, right, they read, they read, and still today when they read Moses, when they read the Old Testament, they read of it as behind a veil. The analogy is with Moses going up in, you know, into the tent of meeting and when he comes out his face is radiating the glory of God, the reflective glory of God. Israel wasn't ready to even to 
hear God. Remember at the foot of Mount Sinai, they stopped up their ears. They didn't want to hear God. They wanted Moses to go up and come down and mediate to them, tell them. They weren't ready to hear the fullness of the truth. They weren't ready to see God's glory even reflected in Moses' face. And so Paul says that God reveals then to himself, to them as of behind a veil. But with Christ, with us, with Jesus Christ, the veil is removed. And this has always been in an interpretive key, a hermeneutical key, if you want a fancy term, right? For interpreting, understanding uh, the Old Testament. The Old Testament has to be read in light of Christ. If we want to understand what was being revealed, we have to reinterpret it in light of Christ. In light of Christ, which is you don't, right? You love your enemies. You don't hate your enemies. That God, who is truth, could not be commanding two different things. He can't change in that way. And so we can see that really in light of Christ that has to be. And, and the fact that it is in the harem, is in, you know, arises in the Deuteronomic you know, covenant between Moses, has to be therefore attributable to Moses. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Good. Well, um, okay. So that was a long way around to a short question. I generally do that. No, no. Um, does that make? Does it? You had a issue or question, but does that make sense to you? Mm-hmm. A little bit. No. Yes. yes. Good. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. So. Oh. It would lead to another question, which uh, well, we're another trail. rabbit trail. Why, yeah, we have this. Why would why would Moses do that? I mean, why he, would he, he seems so close to God? How did that happen? He is close to God, but he's also a fallen human without sanctifying grace. He why <coughs> we try to be very close to God. We are in sanctifying grace. Why do we still sin? <laughs> That's oftentimes called the mystery of iniquity. Moses thought that Moses comes in an environment where that the harem is. I mean, he doesn't invent it. That's a you know that's a cultural, um, you know that's a cultural. Tr- um, it's all throughout the cultures of the ancient Near East. It's simply that God calls for this absolute separation. When people continue to live, Moses sees the absolute separation. How can we exist in these lands, Moses sees, and obey God for absolute separation? Right? Moses sees, well, the harem is the, is the natural, you know. He has no sense that the harem in this regard, where he is, is it, you know, wouldn't be in line. It's, everybody does it. We fall into the same thing. We can very easily fall in. We fall into, you know, we go to entertainment, um, you know, as Catholics, understanding that, you know, uh, that we have to avoid the near occasion of sin, that we are called to purity of heart. But we tend to have no compunction against going to movies or other entertainment that exposes us to the near occasion of sin. Everybody does it. It's there. You can't avoid it. I think an, an interesting uh, way in boiling it down to its raw essence mm-hmm. is that uh, when when humanity eats from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then there is that man's tr- trying to separate good and evil. And once it's in its blood, once it's in his, it's his you know, and it would be Christ that would have to come and right the wrong, you know, and create that separation. Um, so. And I think the other thing just to maybe to think about it is he was uh, in good faith trying to do his best to, <laughs> to keep his people safe and thus introducing things that God wouldn't have introduced like the marriage spirit, or the divorce right, so that they wouldn't kill like harem so that they wouldn't because he knows they're going to fall right into idolatry or into the other people's customs yeah. right so it's it, doesn't come from a bad place, right? He's doing his best, but he's human. Yes. Right? 
Yes. But it's a good and evil thing. Yeah. It's a knowledge of good and evil. So it was a tree we weren't supposed to mess with. <laughs> <laughs> we climbed that tree. We still climb it. <laughs> yes, we still climb it. <laughs> so the um so anyway, Moses is the lawgiver. Jesus is the law. Right? Moses receives the law and gives it. Jesus is the law. Moses speaks God's words to the people as prophet that God gives to him. Jesus speaks from himself as God, who is the law, the God's words. Right? He is the obedient firstborn son, priest, prophet, and king, mediator between God and humanity. And Han points out at the end how, especially in Matthew's gospel, we can see Matthew pointing out over and over and over again Jesus as the fulfillment of Moses. Moses as one of the many types of of, um, of of Christ, of the Christ to come. And Moses, again, in Deuteronomy 18, explicitly says that in his messianic pre- um, prophecy about the, uh, the Messiah who was to come, he would be the prophet, like himself, like Moses, who now, though, would speak to the people God's words directly. Not in a way that Moses was doing indirectly, but now somehow he would be speaking God directly to him. Moses, perhaps, it's unlikely Moses exactly knew, would have known about the incarnation, but he did know something that was coming that would be a greater prophet even than he that was to come. And so Moses is there at, Mo, we, so we have the priestly class that is in some ways distinct from the prophetic kingly class, governing and, and speaking. Moses, when Moses, Moses can't enter the Holy Land, right? This is where we end chapter 9 and enter into chapter 10. He can't enter the Holy Land. We talked about why this was, right? That he, in a sense, by type, crucified Christ the second time. Remember that the first time he was to strike three times this rock and water was to come forth. And after that, he was only supposed to speak it. And then in his anger at the people, he strikes three times again. And this striking of three times, it, it's not, again, that might be <coughs> in one sense um, typological. I mean, it might seem to be more Alexandrian typological until we see that Paul actually says that. The rock, he says, that we don't actually see this explicit in the Old Testament, but he says this rock actually followed, right? followed Israel, Paul points out, in their wilderness wanderings. And he says the rock, he didn't say the rock, he didn't, he didn't say the rock is a type of Christ, he said the rock was Christ. Right? This rock was Christ. And so it's not... Uh, it's not eisegesis to you know to, suggest, to, to say that this was Moses's you know striking of the rock a second time when he was only supposed to speak to it, which is kind of right. This is a, really a type of the mass, isn't it? Where Christ dies on the cross, we don't crucify him again in the mass. As our Protestant we, brothers accuse us of. Right. In a sense, we collapse time in space. We are there. And the Mass is, is as they call it, you know, the Catechism puts it, a re-dash presentation. A re-entering into. We are there at the foot of Calvary. We are there at the right, at the um, stone on Easter Sunday. That's where we are in the Mass. In the Mass, heaven touches earth. So it's not, so we're now speaking the words that make us there. The sacrifice happened. This was a, so. This, in fact, we can see as a type Moses' striking of the rock, by re-crucifying Christ out of anger. And this was why it was so grave. And this is what kept him, who was obedient and so close to God, from being able to enter into the promised land that right, he could only see it from uh, from afar, from um, present-day Jordan. I forget the name of the mountain. 
I like to tell people who've never been to a mass before and they've got to the first time, I said, is it what it says? Okay, well, we're going to do some time travel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good. We're going to do time travel. <laughs> yeah. It is. Time and space. <laughs> so Moses dies outside of the promised land and appoints, say, he appoints um, Joshua as his, uh, as the one to, uh, to take over for him. And Joshua is kind of a type of Moses, right? He's not a priest. He is more or less the um, prophet king. He leads the people into the promised land, and he leads them in to the very first uh, battle that they, are, they enter into is in Jericho. And Jericho is very interesting because it shows that God is going to lead the battle for them. They do something very strange. They, when they go in, they don't go in to battle um, in the way that you might expect. They don't lay up siege walls, you know, with the, you know, around the, in the, um, around the walls of the city of Jericho. They take the um, uh, the mercy seat, right? They take the uh, the um, uh, um, Ark of the Covenant, and they lead in it around, mm -hmm. marching around um, Jericho. The Ark of the Covenant. Every every society basically had its ark. That ark really, though, was to carry the Blessed Mother, and it, or the Blessed Mother, or the the queen mother, the mother of the king. And it was meant as encouragement in these other societies. It was meant as a source of encouragement, a source of, and also a motivation to protect and to fight to protect it. So the ark wouldn't have been in the lead. It would have been protected in the back. Here the ark is in the lead. Where, the, where did the mercy seat phrase come from? It comes from that the mercy seat uh, phrase comes from um, Exodus, I believe. That's where uh, it's one of the names that, um, that Moses gets from God for the ark. For the ark, right? And this is another thing. It, it's it's empty. The ark of the covenant, the seat, the mercy seat for the ark of the covenant is empty. No one's sitting in it. They, it's the queen mother or the representation of the queen mother is on the seat in, uh, in other, you know, the arcs for other societies. Um, in any case, then on the last day, they go around, you know, they march around for seven days, and then the last day they march around seven times, and then the last time they blow the trumpets and the, all the walls fall down. And then, and Jericho is exposed, and then the battle starts, and and Israel uh, defeats Jericho. And so Joshua, he one of the you know one of the only Joshua and Caleb, by the way, remember they were two of the spies that went in to scope out the uh, the Holy Land, and Joshua and Caleb were the only two that uh, you know were true to God. The others were the other spies were were afraid and suggested that's just you know be better if we just stayed where we were. Uh, you know, the Holy Land is or what's called the Holy Land. The Promised Land is full of giants. Giants that uh, we can't possibly defeat. After Joshua... Fake, fake news. Fake news, yeah. There's always been fake news, right? <laughs> Those are the start of CNN. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so... After Joshua dies, there doesn't seem to be a good transition set up. There really is no real kind of structure in place. We have the Levites still who are mediating, and in a certain sense, the Levites as priests are supposed to be teaching. They have a number of roles of teaching and um, and governing, carrying out how to live the. But they are, uh, they're never 
they never live up to uh, the you know they're starting. They're never uh, they're never obedient. They never are the the leaders that they are intended to be. And so we have it seems that they are adrift. And so time and time again, God will raise up we a period this we we'll call the periods of judges a, a judge who kind of acts not as priest but as a prophet king. Did you have a comment? So this just brings up a curious question. Sure. Why? So Joshua and Moses were the leaders. From what I can see. Why weren't they priests? That's a good question. The re the why didn't God make um, the you know. Why didn't God just make uh, Moses the uh, the new priest, prophet, and king after uh, Israel? Well, because Israel, the, this is part lesson. That wasn't supposed to happen until Christ came. Well, it won't happen again until Christ comes, but it's part of the lesson, I think, that God is teaching. He's showing that you are called, you know, the not just the leader of Israel, but the leader of all of the families that make up Israel, right? The father are supposed to be priests, prophets, and kings, but they don't have what it takes by themselves. And so the role after the golden calf, which the firstborn sons allowed to happen, the priestly aspect of, the, of that role was taken away from the firstborn, and it was given to the Levites. The Levites, it, it doesn't explicitly say it's just the offering of sacrifice. What Numbers chapter 5 says is that God says, take what belonged to the firstborn and give it to the Levites. It, it could be, I mean, we could say it's all three aspects of it, and they certainly carry on the priest, prophet, and king aspect of it. But Moses kept, clearly kept prophet and king. And the Levites had the, you know, the cultic, the sacrificial aspect of it uh, that was given to them. The, that separation, I think, in, it foretells the fact that Moses, Moses himself and uh, Israel themselves, no human being is going to be able to arise consistently that will be able to be, carry out the role, the responsibilities a priest, prophet, and king, firstborn son, effectively, not until we achieve, not until Jesus Christ, who will bring them back together. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Separation of power. In a sense, I suppose, mm -hmm. as a lesson. Mm -hmm. right? So the period of judges. Some people look at that and they say, "Well, that's kind of the ideal." You know that well. You know God bring, raises up somebody when we need him, but otherwise we're on we're in this de demo, you know we're back to a democracy, and that's the best best time. But if if you read Judges very carefully, it makes it very clear that that's not the case. They said uh, you know we didn't have any, they didn't have anybody to lead them. They didn't know what to do, so they everybody did bet you know what they thought was right. Everybody just did what they thought was right. And this is kind of this is a you know a <coughs> more of a condemnation of the period, not a exaltation of the period. Eventually, this will we see that the Levites um, ten the f from the Levites the there seems to be this transitions to uh, from judges to kind of the kingly period. Because one of, we could call, Eli is one who rises up who, see, he's not formally in the book of Judges. He's not called by the tradition a judge. But he seems, as a Levite, to carry on the role of judge. But he is not, right, Levi himself, I'm sorry, Eli himself is, he has two sons. And the, you know, by, you know, biology, this, you know, of this, his sons, who he doesn't raise sons very well, his sons very well, or you know, oftentimes we can't say that you know children go astray. And oftentimes, whether they're raised well or not, but he is his sons will be the ones will that'll inherit his judgeship. He seems to be a, a decent 
person in that role, but his sons are not. And God isn't going to allow this, you know, to f- transition to his sons. So he raises up Samuel. What were the sons' names again? Uh, Eli's Hophni uh, and, and Phineas. Yes. Good. No discipline. <laughs> no. That's what he says. He says they were Eli wouldn't discipline them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They were millennials. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were first millennials. Or, <laughs> no. It can happen easily. Yeah. So Samuel comes, and Samuel becomes the, uh, you know, is replaces Eli after Eli dies. Eli dies after, when he, see, he finds that his sons are killed. But Samuel, again, he seems to have, I mean, he was essentially raised from youth uh, by Eli. Seems to have followed the same pattern in raising his sons. And as Samuel grows older, this time so rather than Samuel's sons receiving it, the the people perhaps seeing this uh, this tradition doesn't isn't going to work out very well. They demand a king. Now we have to say that God has already set in place provisions for a king. It's not true that there shouldn't be a king. The question is, is this office of king, should that be separated from the office of um, at least prophet? Should it be a king like the, the nations have? Who's basic, who basically the reason that they you know, have kings is to fight their battles for them. Even though the king rules over them. Right? In God's role, you know, in God's plan for family, the king was a father, not one who lorded it over his subjects, but a father who, who cared for and led his as priest, prophet, and king. The people were so disgusted, if you will, or sort of, and so afraid, probably, I mean, a number of different things. They wanted, they wanted to be like their neighbors. They wanted a king like their neighbors. And so Moses said, when this time comes, this is what the king, uh, any king who isn't, right, prophet, can't do. This applies to everybody who has this governing responsibility, but especially as king. And so the people demand a king. Samuel is upset about the fact that they want a king. They want to take away his governing role, his governing responsibilities. And God is showing Samuel, well, what the people are doing is what they've always done. They are not rebelling against you. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. They're rebelling against me. And Scott Hahn's vignette at the very beginning, right, of giving your children sometimes what they demand so that they can experience the consequences of what they demand is sometimes the best pedagogical tool, the best way to lead them. And so Moses, or so um, God tells Samuel, give them what they want. And they get Saul. And Saul is, a, Saul is young. He seems, a vis- initially, he seems to be a fairly good king. But remember now, he, we, we saw the priestly responsibility be torn, being torn away from the firstborn. Now we see, if you know, with the judge we have prophet and king, we see king and prophet, those two offices, being separated. And in this separation, Samuel, who is of the, you know, he can offer sacrifice because he is, right, he's a judge, but he is in the Levitical class. He can offer the sacrifice. Saul cannot. But Saul, who seems relatively young still at this point in time, he you know, he's, goes off to war. Samuel rewinds him, okay, by the way, after you win, after you, you know, I've seen God is going to bring you victory, don't offer sacrifice until I get there. Remember, you can't do it. I've got to do it. Saul, who is 
you know, who's um, impetuous, I suppose, young. He waits and waits, and Samuel doesn't get there, and he goes, where is this guy? Hey, we want to get on with the feasting. Let's go ahead, you know, and, and I suppose also being somewhat young, he doesn't have a lot of, the, he doesn't seem to have a lot of confidence. In, uh it took him some time for the people to accept him, right? And he oftentimes consents to what the, you know, to the rebellious rabble want. And so they want to get on with things, and he says, okay, well, let's go ahead and offer this sacrifice and get on with things. And Samuel shows up, and he says, what have you done? And Saul tries to make, uh, he tries to make um, excuses, but at, some, at this time, it's, Saul is exactly like us. Because we can be told things, and we can be told things, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense. We can, you know, we can justify and rationalize ourselves, right? But we're just a ra- rationalization is always weak <coughs> reasoning, right? It's vague thinking. And we just don't invest the effort into it. And somebody, and oftentimes we get these ideas from others. Or even they come to us. They're really, I, suspe- I suggest, oftentimes from others. But we don't, we don't think about it very deeply because it rationally justifies why we don't have to do the thing that we would prefer not to have to do, the hard thing. But at some level, we know that that's, this isn't going to hold up. At some level, we're no, we're, okay, you know, la, 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 I don't want to hear that. Um, Saul, when he encounters Samuel, is exactly that way that we, all of us, can experience. Saul, Samuel says, you know, Saul says, well, I don't see what the big deal is. And Saul keeps, or Samuel says, well, yeah, this is a big deal. And one by one, Samuel dismantles Saul's just, you know, rationalizations. And then Saul finally goes, oh yeah, I did. I screwed up. I'm, I am a sinner. I did rebel. This wasn't. And he's truly contrite, right? Yeah. Well, it doesn't appear that he is. I mean, Han points out that he goes, but can't we just forget about that? No, right. Can't we just go, you know, let's just go on. Sweep yeah. out of the cosmic rug. Exactly. He goes, okay, I messed up. My bad. Let's move on. Yeah. So sorry, sorry, not sorry. Exactly. Exactly. Which is. Again, very dangerous. That's bad. It's, it is uh, repentance without repentance. It is an accept. It's an acknowledgement, but an unwillingness to, to change. It's yeah. an unwillingness like to go. We, we go to confession and yeah. we say, "Well, I'll just, I'll just take it to confession." Without a firm purpose of amendment, right? right? Because that demands dying to self. We're not. And Saul to give him a, mm. uh, you know, to give, we do it. As Saul d- did it, he didn't have the grace to be able to die to himself the way we are. So Saul is actually us, but more excusable than us. So it's always helpful to um, go back, you know, and realize that right, that uh, we have to take our lessons from what we see. To reveal to ourselves when we do that. So Saul is now going to be replaced. He's not going to be replaced right away, but he will eventually be replaced. His son won't inherit his kingship. And Saul, very ironically, actually, from his perspective, even accidentally, brings into, really is part of his family. David actually is brought in, he's, he becomes, he hears that David, not, you know, he's, he can play uh, the, um, the flute pretty well. And the way that he plays it really must have been really good. Because, uh, you know, it helped to... Saul, after this, we start to see... Remember, after his fall, he starts to be attacked by demons. 
and these these attacks by demons seem to actually drive him crazy. He seems to have periods of going mad, certainly not being very rational. But David's playing the flute seems to be able to calm him down, and so he brings him in. He, he loves him as a son. He eats at his table. Right? This eating at the table of the king means that you are really kind of an adopted as part of the family. And this is really after David has been pointed out to Samuel, and Samuel has anointed David as the, as the successor of Saul, which won't come for some time yet. It won't come until after Saul ultimately is killed. And David and Saul and Saul's firstborn son, the one who, will, who should um, inherit the, king, the kingship, it, Jonathan, David and Jonathan become best of friends. And Jonathan mm-hmm. seems to understand, it's not clear that Jonathan knows explicitly mm-hmm. what's coming, but he seems to, you know, that his, his father's lost the kingship and that it's not going to be given to him, but he seems to understand that. Um, Han points out one point where in Jonathan making this pact with David, Jonathan hands over to David his royal garb that you know symbolizes this idea that David and not Jonathan will be the uh, the king to follow uh, to follow Saul. Jonathan was a good egg. He was a good egg. He he is one at least the way that he is represented in um, you know in scripture. He almost seems to be one that would have he had been the king. Well, he would have been. A, it seems like he would have, in being willing to give it over, he would have been a good king. He had humility. He had humility. He yeah. seemed, he seemed even more than David. David was, you know, David was given that because he had a heart like. Look at the David. David had sinfulness that was very, very great. He was an adulterer and a murderer. <coughs> You know, at the same time, for the same reason. But it, in having a heart like, you know, like unto God, he, unlike Saul, who had to be, right, who rationalized and, and then minimized his fault, when David was shown his fault, he could see it, and he repented. Um, one time, when I wouldn't necessarily go with this, but... One uh, one theologian b- basically said that um, he would sin like David if he could uh, repent like David. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, of course, is a legalistic way of looking yes. at sin. But quick, quick question: yeah. Yeah. Jesse the Bethlehem- Bethlehemite. Yes, that's the dad. That's David's father. Is he? Daddy. Is this the first appearance? Is this He's just one of those ones that he just comes up out of nowhere, and that's where and and uh, Saul goes and or Samuel goes and finds him and says, "We're going to take one of your sons." Yeah. Yes. General. Yeah. From Jesse's perspective, he doesn't pop up out of nowhere, but from the biblical <laughs> narrative perspective, he does. Yeah. From <laughs> Jesse. <laughs> yeah. I'm here. Yeah. 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 Been here, always been here. Yeah. 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 What about me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a song. Actually, that, we yeah. brought up that song. Yes, what, what about me? What about me? Oh, um, <laughs> okay. So I suppose we're, we've run short on time. Um, the very end of this is simply the fact that at the end of the day, Saul is continually... He knows that he's losing, he's going to lose his kingship. He still wants it to go to Jonathan. And he comes to realize that it's going to be going to David. And perhaps even the demons are the ones who are motivating him, who he has kind of given himself over to, to kill David. So he, he becomes very, I mean, he looks very schizophrenic. He goes from loving him to hating him, to loving him to hating him, to trying to kill him, to... And Jonathan, his love for David is so great that he is the one who protects David. 
he helps to he can't withstand his father but he does um, give David warnings when David needs the warnings in order to be protected um, but we can pick up uh, next time on uh, 203 a new king uh, say that again um, what? Um, a new king well let's finish with let's do 200 the rise and fall of a ruler okay um, we're close to the we are very close to the end it didn't seem like there was that much okay well then let's Try to finish at the beginning, but move on to at least the first part of 11. No, that's a very good idea. Let's plan on doing 11 next time, and we kind of can finish up with uh, a new king in the making, which you're right. It's basically an entree to uh, chapter 11 anyway.